Well, guys, we're going to get started here this morning. We're going to pick up exactly where we left off because the last time I talked, I was in here with you guys. So uh, we are talking about being controlled by the Holy Spirit and what that looks like. And we talked about the wives, what God calls a wife to be. And we've been focusing on what the, God calls a husband to be. I've got, I'll bring, I've got one more. I'm one short here. I've got them over here. So I've got plenty more. And then, oh, you had enough? Well, that just shows my math there. It's early. That's right. It's early. That's right. I didn't have to take my shoes off to count there, so I <laughs> pulled it off. Um, there'll be a, some good review here, uh, but since it's been a, a month, so we need a little review, I'm sure. Sometimes I can't remember what I heard last week. Ephesians 5.18, verse 21 says this, Be filled with the Spirit. And then verse 21 says, And be subject to one another in fear for Christ. The filling and the control of the Holy Spirit will lead us to a spirit of humility. To the spirit that gives us the desire to seek the welfare of others before our own and to be mutually submissive. And the rest of chapter 5, book of Ephesians, through uh, chapter 6, verse 9, Paul will expand on the principles of believer submission as it controls the relationship of husband and wives, children and parents, slaves and masters. We saw in Genesis 3.16 that part of the curse for Adam and Eve's sin was that it said, God said, I'm going to greatly multiply your, your pain in childbirth. You will de- when you deliver children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That there will be this constant friction between husband and wife. She'll want to rule over him, he'll want to rule over her. And so, I think we all could testify, ladies, I know you could, that there's pain in childbirth. Um, I've seen it. It looks very painful. Um... And I know that there's conflict between man and woman. And God is calling us through the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to overcome that, uh, to work in harmony. Before the fall, Adam and Eve worked harmonious, and there was no contention. There was not even a thought of that. Uh, but once they sinned, then they became contention. And so what God is calling us to, we're going to see here, is it's supernatural. It's not something that in and of ourselves we have the ability to do. Ladies, you don't have the ability to be the, have the, ability to be the wife God's calling you to. And men, we don't have the ability to be the husband that God's calling us to without the power of the Holy Spirit. Without us entrusting ourselves to Him. Without us praying uh, and seeking His guidance and direction. This is a, a, a task that is... It is unattainable uh, without the power of the Holy Spirit, without us yielding to Him. We're totally 100% depend upon God to fulfill these roles. And we are to fulfill these roles no matter if our spouse has done that or not. God calls me to be the husband to Angie. They calls me to be right here. There are no exemptions. It doesn't say, unless she does this. Right? No. I'm to be this husband right here no matter what. She's to be that wife matter what. Uh, and so the husband's role is defined in Ephesians 5, 25 through 31. Doesn't matter what the movies say, doesn't matter what any other books say, this is what God, this is what God defines as a godly husband. And that's our desire to be a godly husband. This is what he says. Husbands love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having not spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but as she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We asked the question, or I asked the question, why, why are husbands called to love their wives and not called to submit to them? Well, that's kind of a, a tricky question there, and the commentary will help decipher this question here. It says this, The husband's primary submission to his wife is through his love for her. So it's through our love that we're submitting to our wife. It says the apostle makes it clear that this is a balanced kind of love. 
Husbands are to love their wives just as Christ, Christ also loved the church. A Christian has Christ's own nature and Holy Spirit within him. God thereby, thereby provides for husbands to love their wives with a measure of Christ's own kind of love. The husband who submits to the Lord by being filled with the Spirit is able to love his wife with the same kind of love Jesus has for his own bride, the church. The Lord's pattern of love for his church is a husband's pattern of love for his wife. Paul mentions four qualities of that divine love that the husbands are to exemplify towards their wives. Like the Lord's, the husband is to love. His love is to be sacrificial, to be purifying, caring, and unbreakable. Sacrificial, we looked at that. We look at Christ and his life. He gave his life for us. He gave us an example to follow. And in this commentary, it says, A husband is not commanded to love his wife but because of what she is. Or is not. He is commanded to love her because it is God's will for him to love her. So anytime you're not loving your wife, you are not in God's will. You're not pleasing the Lord. Remember that. Remember that. You are not pleasing the Lord if you're not loving your wife or loving your husband. It is certain intended that a husband is to admire and to be attracted to his wife's beauty or winsomeness or kindness or gentleness or any other positive quality or virtue. But though such things being great blessings and enjoyment, they're not the bond of marriage. So, you know, marriage is a commitment. Divorce is never an option. You are committed to that person till death do you part, right? And that doesn't mean you take them out, right? But you, can, you, you kill them. That means, Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Uh, it's till death do you part. You're committed, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, right? We've all said those, and health and, you know, and health and sickness. That's what marriage is. There are no outs. Uh, you are in it for the long haul, and you'll work through anything together. Now, again, as much as this depends upon you, you may have a spouse that doesn't want to do that, and you can't do anything about that. But all you can be is the best wife, the best husband that you can be. And if the, that person's a Christian and is seeking out of the Lord, they're going to want the same thing. And it's going to be so much easier, uh, guys, if we are following the Lord for our wives to follow us. Right? And uh, it's going to be so much easier to love your wives if she is, is following the Lord. It's just, it's just, it's going to be easier. He goes on to say, if every appealing char characteristic and every virtue, virtue of his wife disappears, a husband's still under just as great obligation to love her. If anything, he's under a great obligation because the need for healing and the restorative power of his selfless love is greater. I've heard John MacArthur say that he's had people come in his uh, office to have pre, uh, to not have premarital counseling, but counseling. Uh, they're having problems in their marriage, and no, they're wanting a divorce. And they'll just say, I just don't love him anymore. Or I just don't love her anymore. You know, we've grown apart. And his very first thing he says to him is, then you need to repent. You need to repent. Because God says to love. You need to confess that sin to the Lord. And, and that's what it is. And that's the kind of counsel that we need because that's what God wants us to. God wants us to love our spouse. And look, if you think that you can see flaws in your wife or you can see flaws in your husband, you need to look in the mirror because you've got bigger ones. Right? I don't need to be taking the speck out of my wife's eye when I've got a big log stuck in my eye. You know, you can look at, well, you know, he's not the same as he was, or she's not the same as she was. Yeah, I mean, when me and Angie got married, I had hair. You know what I'm trying to say? It's gone. I can't do nothing about it. I mean, I guess I could do one of those surgeries or wear a, a wig, but that just say, I just don't want to do that. I've got the horseshoe, you know what I'm saying? That's all I've got. But, but anything. Uh, we change, but you know what? It doesn't matter. What? Because we love one another. That person you married all those years ago, you, you still love them. You go through all things together. You know, there's ups and downs. There's peaks and valleys, right, in our relationships. And that's what makes us stronger. That's what makes us stronger. It goes on to say, you're, again, you're under a greater kind of uh, obligation. It says, this is the kind of love process for the church. And therefore, it's the kind of love every Christian husband is to have for his wife. The husband who loves his wife, as Christ loves the church, gives everything he has for his wife, including 
his life if necessary. I, I know we've all talked about this before, but Pastor Allen's saying, you know, I'll die for you, honey. You know, well, we, I don't want you to die for you. Just pick up your socks. You know, we just put your underwear in the hamper. You know, we just take out the trash. You know, we, you know, I'm trying to say there's, there's the little things that we need to be doing too to show our love to our spouse. It goes on to say, um, if a loving husband is willing to sacrifice his life for his wife, he's certainly willing to make the lesser sacrifices for her. He puts his own likes, his desires, his opinions, his preferences, his welfare aside. If that is required, to please her and to meet her needs. He dies to self in order to live for his wife because that is the that is the Christ kind of love demands. That is his submission. So think about that, guys. The next time you want to go out to eat, ask your wife where she wants to eat. You know, maybe you like the same things, but Angie is a Mexican girl. She loves Mexican food. That's not my favorite. I like it. I mean, don't get me wrong, but if I want out, I'm like. Let's go to Mexico. You know, that's not going to be, that you're not going to hear me say that. Uh, I like Chinese food, so I like to go to Chinese food. Now, she likes Chinese food, but she loves Mexican food. So, uh, and there'll be times when I'm just in the mood for tap, you know, and I'll be like, man, I don't, I don't want to. You know, we just had spaghetti the other night. You know, or whatever, you know, you think of. Um, you know, think about that. Just putting the other person first. You know, uh, maybe she wants to go to... Uh, the beach. You're not a big fan of the beach. You'd rather go to, I don't know, snow skin, mountains. snow skin or something, mountains or something. You know, you'd rather do something. Think about that person and what it means to her. You know, um, you know. One thing I'm trying to do is, is, uh, is I'm trying to, like, bend where I don't want to bend. Like, she may want to go on a trip, and I'm like, oh, I like to stay here. And you know, there's a project I like to do, or you know, something. A task I'd like to accomplish, and but you know she wants to go somewhere. You know what I'm saying, and so I should take the time, you know, to go. Uh, she wanted to go to the fair this year. I did not want to go to the fair this year. I was like Angie, you know, we don't go to the fair, and we don't have kids. We don't ride rides, you know. And I mean, I am a fan of the food. Don't get me wrong, you know, I, I will eat the food. But uh, but anyway, and uh, she wanted to go, so I was like, okay, you know, we'll go. You know, we'll go. Well, actually, I won't say it happened like that. I'll say about after 30 hints. When I'm, I'm, I'm like kid, and I was driving to driving from leaving, and I was like, Doug, she, you know, just I talked to myself. You know, she mentioned the fair again. You know, she probably wants to go to the fair. You know what I'm trying to say? And so I called her. I was like, Angie, I could be wrong on this, but it seems like you mentioned the fair a couple times. Are you wanting to go? And, well, yeah. And I was like. <clears throat> Well, no, we got Cooper. You know, I was trying to, you know, we got to take care of the dog. You know, let him suffer and all that. Exactly. So anyway, uh, not saying I didn't try to weasel out of it. Uh, but anyway, we went. It was a great time. You know, it was crowded. Like I was just, you know, it was a little warm, but not as warm as it's been. And it was very nice. And we only stayed a couple hours and, you know, saw things that we wanted to see. And, and uh you know, but I was thankful. You know, she had really meant a lot to her. She kept saying, thanks for going to the fair. And really, it was nothing. I mean, it really was. I mean, we just went to the fair and came home. It wasn't a big sacrifice. What The dog lived. You know, he survived and uh, all that. Um, but, you know, I, I just encourage you to listen. You know, just p try to pick up on things. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, you know, um, listen to them. I try... Uh, with Angie, like for Christmas, you know, it's very hard to buy for people for Christmas. I'm, I, but I try to listen throughout the year and hear her say like she likes something. You know, so I'll write that down or something, you know, to go back and try to, to look for it or something. Just pay attention is what I'm trying to say to your, your spouse and make the sacrifices. Um, you know, because one day it may just be me and it'll be Chinese every day. You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, yeah, I'll be wishing I was going to a Mexican restaurant. You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, just take that for granted and celebrate your, your differences and uh, make the most of it. I keep telling Angie, it kills me because I'll find these Mexican restaurants and I'll find an item on there that I like. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, I like that, so I go there every time. That's, that's what I'll go to. They always take it off the menu. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm always trying to search for, some, search for something else. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The next is a purifying love. We talked a little bit 
about that last week. Love wants only the best for the one it loves. It cannot bear uh, for the love. I'm sorry. It cannot bear for a loved one to be corrupted or misled by any evil or harmful thing. When a husband's love for his wife is like Christ's love for his church, he will continually seek to help her purify her any sort of defilement. He will seek to protect her from the world's contamination and protect his, her holiness, virtue, and purity in every way. He will never induce her to do whatever is wrong and unwise or expose her to that which is less than good. And we talked about last week that uh, in John MacArthur's commentary on this verse, he talked about a, these two pastors that were on a talk show and they were asked about Playboy magazine. And this is probably you know, the 70s or 80s, I don't know, it's not recent. Um, what they thought about it. And um, the first pastor was like, it's ungodly, uh, it's, uh, it goes against the Lord, it's unholy, wouldn't let his eyes look upon such a thing. And the other pastor had the opposite view. He thought it was helpful. He and his wife had brought that into their marriage and, and uh, found it to be helpful in the spots of their bedroom and all these different things. And, and MacArthur's point was, you know, the first man honored his wife. And would never see that. He would not defile her to bring that in. The other pastor did. And found it beneficial. And so you can see the contrasts of the two. Uh, which do you think was being obedient to God and loving his wife as Christ loved the church? The first one. Yeah, yeah the first one, right. And so uh, we need to be concerned with our wife's holiness. I, uh, there used to, uh, there still is uh, a Song of Solomon. I don't know if you've ever saw that with Tommy Nelson, uh, we did that here a couple times at the church. Um, but the youth version, um, I, I watched it one time with youth, and um, one of the coolest things in that the movie to me was uh, this, this couple that had uh, determined that they were not going to sexually defile themselves. They were going to keep themselves pure before marriage. Um, they were getting married. And the bride looked at the groom and she said, thank you for keeping me holy and pure. You know, that he never, never challenged that or never tried to get her to compromise that, but he protected her purity. And, you know, that is what a husband is to do. Uh, the Bible is telling us here that we're to wash her with the water of the word, right? That's what he says. That's the husband's role. That is the husband's role. It's not the wife's role. It's the husband's role. John 17, 17, Jesus praying for us. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 26, this is having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he represent to himself, the church in all her glory, having not spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Of course, this is talking about Christ in the church, but it's also a picture of a husband and wife. And the husband's role is to be able to cleanse his wife with the washing of the water of the word. Can a lost man do that? No. A lost man can't do that. The things of God are foolishness to him. He's perishing, right? That's why it's so important that when we get married, that we're marrying a Christian, a believer. Because it's going to take the power of the Holy Spirit for this man to be able to fulfill this role. But we see clearly it is the role of the husband. The husband is to be the spiritual leader at the home. It is his God-given responsibility. And I'm going to show you that in Scripture. Genesis 2, 15-18. We're very familiar with this. Then God took the man. What was the man? Adam. Right, very good. Put the man in the garden to cultivate it, to tend it. Then the Lord commanded the man. Who did he command? The man. Saying what? From any tree of the garden you may eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on that day you will eat from it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Who did God tell not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The man. That's right. Commanded it. Right? Then what does God do? He sees it. He needs a helper. Right? So man is first. Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God really said you shall not eat from any of the tree of the garden? Did Satan know what God had said? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. So he said, you can't eat from any tree of the garden. He knows that she can eat from any tree of the garden but one. But he says, you can't eat from any tree of the garden? And he says, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. How did Eve know what God had said? Adam told her. Is that what God said? No. no. What is different about what God told Adam and what what Eve has said God said? She embellished it. Yes. If she touched it. If she she touched touch it. it. Yeah. Right. Right? Because then he says, look at the top there where I've highlighted it. You can eat from the knowledge of good and evil. You shall eat from that day. For that day you can eat from it. You will certainly die. Right? But she says... You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Did she embellish it or did Adam go the extra mile? Say, just don't even touch it. You know, I can, that's, that's me. I say, don't, just don't even touch it. Don't even look at that's it. right. That's what I'm saying. Going back, it should have been don't even look at it because if you remember, as we're going to see, as she looked at it. That's, but anyway, Adam may have added on there. I don't know. But anyway, she knows what God has said. So Adam's told her. I was told. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that on that day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a light to her eyes, and it was and the tree was desirable to make one wise, and how did she make all those decisions? Based on her judgment, right? Based on her judgment. The Bible tells us not to what? Lean on our own understanding. But I always acknowledge him, and he'll make our path straight. She makes a judgment based on her saying, God is a liar. What God has said is not true. Because it looks good. It looks good. Let's see what time we have here. Okay. Look, look what happens here. It says, She took some of the fruit and ate. Right? She took some of the fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband. Now, let's think about this. Let's stop right there. She's taken the fruit. She's bitten. And what has happened? She becomes sinful. Huh? She becomes sinful. Well, does she? She's definitely sinful. She's disobeyed the Lord. But what is the consequence? Death. Huh? Death. Death, right? Did she die? Not yet. Nothing. Nothing has happened. Nothing has happened to Eve. She's taken it, she's eaten it, and it may have tasted good. I don't know. But what does she do? She gives it to her husband. What, let me tell you what didn't happen. She didn't take a bite of the apple and go, you're naked. What did I do? Yeah. She, didn't, she didn't do that. But look what happens when she gives it to Adam. Look what it says. And she gave some to her husband, or the husband was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked, that they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves uh, coverings. Do you see what happened? It was when Adam took the body. It was when Adam took the body that everything changed. You see? Did they not know they were naked? <laughs> no, they didn't know they were naked because there, was no, there wasn't the knowledge, that knowledge, you know, that shame or anything that you feel. Yeah, they didn't know. They didn't know. They hid from the Lord. Yeah, and that's when they hid from the Lord. Why? Because it's sin. What happens when you sin? You want to hide, right? You don't want no way to know, right? You want to cover up, right? It, you know, these days is not the way it was, but when I was growing up, you see people get arrested, you know, and they would put a bag over the head or they did, you know. Nowadays, they're, you know, they're sticking their head out. I want everybody to see it. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're proud of it. But, uh, but the point here I think that we see is God told Adam Adam was to lead Eve. Adam was right there with Eve. It says he was right there with her. I mean, why didn't he say, hey, what are you doing? You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that you know, I question, like, why did he not stop? But it was Adam's responsibility. Right? Adam's responsibility. Look in Daniel. You remember the story of Daniel? Uh, King Darius is tricked. 
into uh, making that law where you could only uh, pray to him. You remember that? And the consequence was to be thrown in the lion's den. Look at this in Daniel 6, 23-24. Uh, King Darius is around there to make sure that Daniel has survived the night that his God has kept him safe. Since then the king was very glad and gave orders for Daniel to be lifted up out of the den. He's alive. So Daniel was lifted out of the den. No injury was found on him because he was trusted, because he trusted in his God. The king then gave orders and brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and what? Threw them, look, their children and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den for the lions had overpowered them and crushed all their bones. So what did these men do? They lied. They tricked the king to throw on the godly man into the lion's den to be eaten. And God saved him. What was the consequence of these men's actions? They all, not just the men, the families. the families went with him. Do you see the consequences of that choice? That his family suffered? They led in a wrong way consequences to everybody. Look here in Matthew 18. This is the parable that Jesus tells of the talents. You remember Jesus, uh, Peter comes to him and says, Lord, how many times do I forgive my brother? Seven times? He goes, 70 times seven. And he goes on to tell him this parable. The one that owed him the 10,000 talents, he could not repay it. It could not be paid. It was a, a sum that could not be uh, paid for. The, he f pleads for forgiveness uh, for this debt. And that's where we pick it up, in the story that Jesus tells in verse 25. But since he did not have the means to repay, his master commanded him that he be sold along with what? Like his wife and children and all he had for repayment to be made. <coughs> What does the, the husband do? He gets himself in a debt that he cannot pay. He gets himself in over his head. Who suffers? Even in this story, everybody. Yeah. Everybody. Guys, when we're not the husbands, when we're not making sure that our homes are purified, that what we and ourselves, or me and my house will serve the Lord, when we're not doing that, there's great consequences. This is what God's called us to. And that's what we need to be. And that's who God is wanting us to be. It's not that your wife's not spiritually mature. It has nothing to do with that. But it's our job. It's our responsibility. When we're not that, our family suffers. Our wives are vulnerable. And our children are vulnerable. And we're vulnerable. But this is what God's called us to. And there's great consequences when we don't. 1 Corinthians 14, 33-35, and I just want to explain what's going on here. In that chapter, uh, Paul is dealing with all the chaos that's going on in church. Speaking in tongues and interpretation. The, the, the worship service is just chaos. Okay, and so he's correcting all these things and giving them the structure that it should have. In verse 33, the second part of this, it says, As in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches. Does that mean a woman cannot talk? No. It does not mean what that doesn't mean you can't speak. Uh, what it means is that a woman can't prophesy, cannot lead the worship, cannot proclaim the word, to, cannot preach. Uh, you can have some women Sunday school teachers that are teaching women or teaching children. That's not what it's saying. It's talking about in the worship service. Women were even questioning what was being taught in the middle of the worship services. And this is what it says. This is, the, this is what God says should happen. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are what? Subject themselves, just as, as the law is also. So if you desire to learn anything, let them what? Ask their own husbands from home. For it is proper for a woman to speak, for it is not proper, improper for a woman to speak in church. So who has the responsibility to explain to the wife what is being taught? The husband. The husband. The husband is. Right? It's clear in Scripture that the husband is to be the leader. In fact, when we look at the, the characteristics of what a pastor is to be, and even deacons, we see here in 1 Timothy 3, 2-5, it says this, As an overseer, they must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, 
prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to much wine or pugnacious, but gentle, uncontentious, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So we see a lot of qualifications there, but it talks about the home. Right? And what is it what is he held responsible for there? How it's ran, right? How it's ran. And so if it's not ran right, then what does that happen? What happens? It disqualifies it. Right? It disqualifies. And this commentary explains that. It says that the true spirituality of a church leader is not measured best by how well he leads the deacons or elders, or an elders meeting, but the way he participates by the way he participates in Sunday school or by the way he speaks from the pulpit. None of those things matter. He may be a great leader in all those areas. But the way that he treats his wife and his children at home when no one else is around. Nowhere is our relationship to God better tested than our relationship to our family. The man who plays the part of a spiritual shepherd in the church but who lacks love and care in the home is guilty of a spiritual fraud. The world continues to tell men to be macho, to defend himself, to assert himself, to bring attention to himself, and to live totally for himself. But God tells the Christian man to give himself up for others, especially for his wife, just as Christ gave himself up for the church. That is God's call. It's a big call. You know, when I got married, I had no idea what a husband was to be. No idea. I wasn't even saved. I had no idea. And every year, as I get older and older, and I continue to learn more and more, I realize how great the call is. And how incapable I am of doing it. And I, I see it all the time. Because we're called to be like Christ. And I'm far away from being like Christ. I want to be, but there's more than want. You got to do it. You got to do it. And so our example is Jesus Christ. When we look at Christ, how would Christ handle that? You know, think about that. How did he? He showed us an example. He gave himself up for us. He served. You know, he served us. He he sacrificed himself for us. And what an example that we have. And God is calling us to be holy, set apart, pure. And that's what we should be striving for. And the way that we're going to be able to do that is the light of God's Word. God's Word is going to sanctify us. It's going to wash over us. That means we're going to pick up things in the world. And guys, it's our responsibility to know God's Word, to be able to apply it, to be able to watch it. It doesn't mean, learn this the hard way, that you hold your wife's head underneath the water of God's Word until she gets it. It says the washer, like you wash a baby. Right? I'm going to tell you something that you all won't know. It's embarrassing to say, but it's the truth. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Al at night was talking about things not to say to your wives. Remember that? At the end, he was saying this, talking about how to edify your wives. These are things you shouldn't say. Well, I want to tell you, one of those things that he said didn't come from that article or commentary that he found. One of those things was something I said. And only a few people knew it. David hell knew it because he kept looking at me and laughing. <laughs> David, you're going to give us up. Everybody's going to know. Right? Uh, this is, we first moved here. The kids probably were five and three or four and six, something like that. And um, I was working a lot, and I was at church a lot, and I wasn't home a lot. And Angie was uh, with the kids. She was homeschooling them, and, and uh, she said, you know, um, Doug, you know, we need you here. You know, we don't see you. And we need you here. The, kid, the boys need you. And, um, you know, and I was like, this is my mentality. You know, I was like, Angie, you know, I work, you know, and I go to church. That's it. I'm not in the softball league, you know, where I'm, I'm not going hunting, you know, or, or whatever. There's nothing wrong with those things. I'm not in any of those things. And she said, well, Doug, when you are here, you're tired. And when you are here, you're harsh. 
And she goes, you're going to have to pick and choose something. You know, I'm not telling you to quit your job. I'm not telling you to give up church. I'm telling you there's got to be a balance because we have an important part in your life as well and these boys need you. And I said this. I can't remember a lot of scripture, but unfortunately this one I could. And I said, get behind me, Satan. You don't have, you don't have to think of things that God in mind, but the things of man. I said that. And trust me, when you say it, like Pastor Allen says, fire. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, you know, standing in the middle of the hurricane going, gosh, I can't believe it was this bad. You, know? <laughs> you stood in the middle of it, you started, so I set my own fire. Um, but I, anyway, I did say that. But that's not the purifying that's talking about. Uh, I, she didn't need to be washed with the word. I need to be washed with the word, and the muzzle put on me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is, is there's grace in marriage. We make mistakes. And uh, we want to err on the side of grace, right? And God's word, he's given it to us to, to give us as a light to our path, right? Uh, that we won't be wise in our own eyes, but we'll acknowledge the Lord and, and he's going to make our path straight. And so if you're striving for this, this is God's call. This is what he wants us for. Because our marriage is our images of Christ in the church. And we want him to be glorified in every area of our life. Right? And so I encourage you just to, to, to look at your marriage. It'll be the husband that you can be, the be the wife that you can be, but realize totally you're totally dependent upon the Lord to be able to do that. Any questions or comments? I think I'm maybe running late here. No, I'm not good. Any comments? Compromise. Compromise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's not, you know, look, I've done things. You know, there's compromise, and then they're like, uh, how can I say this? You may do it, but like, I think Pastor Allen said this, or John MacArthur one, I can't remember. Talked about the little boy, told him to sit down, he wasn't sitting down. To sit down, I'm going to spank you. No, so, so, sit down, got a little smack on the bottom, then he sat down. He's like, no, you sit there for five minutes. And the kid said to the parent, uh, I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside I'm standing up. <laughs> you know, which sounds like come for me. You, know, like, uh, you can have the wrong attitude. You know, you can make the compromise, but gripe the whole time. You know what I'm trying to say? You can make the other person miserable. But you know, the 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 thing of it is, is just being so in love with that person that you know you're just you know it doesn't. What does it matter what you eat? You're going to, guess what? I'm going to eat again. I'm probably going to eat in four hours. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, you know what? It's not a big, it's not a big deal. Uh, you know, that really shows love for that person. And, and a thing that we're going to get into later is listening. Listen. A lot of times as men, we want to fix. Right? I'm like that. And as you say, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. Like, what good is that? You know, that's not helping anything. Huh? But that's what she needs. And I need to learn that. But... Anyway, enough about me. Um, any other questions, comments? All right, guys. Well, hopefully we'll wrap up the husbands and we'll move on to children, to employees, and, and masters, and then to the government, our submission to the government. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. I'm so thankful to have it. It is a lamp to our feet. It is a light to our path. It is what makes us wise. It is how we know you, and it is how we know ourselves. And so, Father, I just pray we continue to surrender to that word, that we continue just to be the husbands and the wives that you called us to be. That's what we're striving for. We know we'll never perfect it, but that is the direction of our lives, that we want to glorify you and honor you in all areas of our life. And so, Father, I pray for each of our marriages that you'll just grow us, Father. And I pray, Father, for Pastor Allen as he comes forth to proclaim your word. Uh, just prepare all of our hearts to receive it. If there's someone here today that does not know you, I pray that you open their eyes for losses and drag them to yourself. And I just pray that, that word as it washes over us, I know it's going to accomplish its purpose, and I just pray we surrender to it, that you just continue to shape and mold us into the image of Christ, that you have your way with us here today. Pray for David and the choir and the praise team and everybody, that you just lead us in worship, Father, that every song that we sing is glorified to you, and that you take away all distractions and hinder us from hearing your word. I pray your blessing upon uh, Anna, she leads the children's church, and upon all those that are loving our children in the nursery.